call it that. The official name is Portland Breakwater Light. And uh, we're standing on land here that's pretty new land. It wasn't here maybe 60 or so years ago. This was all filled in going way back. At one time, this light was at the end of about a 2,000 foot breakwater. So it went way, you know, it was a long walk out to the lighthouse. It would have gone way back there somewhere. Um, back in 1831, there was a big storm here that did a lot of damage in Portland Harbor in this area. So they decided to build a breakwater. They were going to first build about a 2,500 foot breakwater to protect the harbor. If you, know, if you know what a breakwater is, like this part here, just granite blocks used for sheltering a harbor. And uh, they're going to build a 2,500 foot one. They never finished it. They only built about 1,800 feet, and they put a little wooden lighthouse at the end. And uh, I don't know if you saw the binder. I got a picture of the first lighthouse that was here. It's right here, if you want to pass that around. That was the first Portland breakwater light. And they did not build a keeper's house for the keepers here. So the, the tenders, the, the keepers, the people who took care of the light had to uh, walk out on the breakwater to take, take care of it. And that was not such an easy job in winter. They had to walk out 1,800 feet on a, maybe an icy breakwater or in wind and storms, whatever. So it's kind of a tough job. Uh, in, 1870, in the 1870s, they extended the breakwater another couple of hundred feet and they built this lighthouse at the end of it. The earlier wooden lighthouse was taken apart and moved over to uh, an island in the Casco Bay called Little Diamond Island. And I believe maybe, Norm, I don't know if you know anything about this. I don't think any part of it is still standing as far as I know. Um, it was used as some sort of a lookout tower for years, something to do with a buoy station there. I don't know if you know. I, mean, I don't really know. There was a, a buoy station at that island, and they used the lighthouse as a lookout tower. Um, so this one was built in 1875. It's the only lighthouse of its type. Some people think that a man named Thomas Eustick Walter, who designed the Capitol Dome, the, ca the dome of the Capitol in Washington, the Capitol building, they think that he may have designed this, but nobody seems to know for sure. He may have at least had a hand in designing it, but uh, nobody knows for sure. But you can see it's got columns around it. They're called fluted columns. There are six of them, and then it's got that ornamentation at the top. It's modeled after a Greek monument from the 4th century BC. Uh, and uh, I don't know if anybody uh, knows the correct pronunciation, but I'll try it. It was called the Karagic Monument of Lysicrates, or Lysocrates, <laughs> I don't know. But if anybody uh, knows better, please tell me. But anyway, so it was modeled after that Greek monument. And uh, they finally added a house here in 1889. Uh, and it was odd looking because the house was attached to the lighthouse and it overhung the sides of the breakwater. It was wider than the breakwater, so it was kind of an odd looking here. Um, so finally the keepers lived at the lighthouse. In uh, 1934 they electrified the light and the keepers over at Spring Point Ledge Light over there also took care of this light so they had to watch both lights. Then in 1942 they deactivated the light uh, like a lot of lights in World War II pretty much mo most or close to all of American lighthouses were deactivated for security reasons during World War II. They turned this off in 42 and they never relit it. They decided it wasn't needed anymore because by that time they had filled in all this land. Last year in October they had. is built on a cast iron caisson made up of uh, cast iron plates cast in Pennsylvania and built in place here by divers, hard hat divers, 
The water is about 14 feet deep. They built this in place, and once they got up to the full height, it's 25 feet in diameter, and they got up to the full height of 40 feet. They then uh, poured cement, and they pour cement underwater, and then once they got above the water line, they pour a different mix of cement to where they got it to a depth of 33 feet, nine inches. So it's a gigantic block of cement bolted to the ledge encased in iron. And the iron plates are about an inch and a quarter thick. But when you look at them, you'll see a lot of cracking. And this is either, this was due to old ice damage. We used to have a lot of ice here apparently. And more to seismic cracking. In other words, any tremor in the earth, this thing's bolted to bedrock. And we are right on a fault. So apparently, it has its effect on this structure. When was this built? 1896, it was started in August and was finished in early 1897. And it was uh, first lighted on May 24th, 1897. This is a kitchen level. This is where the capers would hang out and uh, do their uh, cooking. Just like that drawing. Uh, the level, the next level up is the keeper's quarters. He had a pretty nice level. And the uh, level above that was the assistant keeper. And when you get up there, you'll see that the assistant keeper was lucky. He had a ladder right through the middle of his quarters where people could walk up and down all night. These lighthouses are so-called hardship situations. These are stag lighthouses. No wives, no families. They all had families and they lived ashore, but the men only lived here. Two keepers, keeper and assistant. And I have just recently found out as the uh, lighthouse service got civil serviceized in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, I've always told people they didn't get time off except maybe to go home overnight. Turns out that by the 1920s, lighthouse keepers <laughs> were had 30 days of off time per year, provided that they paid for their replacement. And knowing lighthouse keepers and the high rate of salary they got, I doubt if anybody ever took 30 days or anything close to it. But they were entitled to leave time, but they had to buy a replacement. They couldn't just rely on their assistance. They had to have somebody. So it probably never really happened. They had to do everything out here. They maintained the place as they do with all lighthouses. The unique thing about this for lighthouse people is that to the best of our knowledge, it's the only case on light in the United States you can go into uh, because they're all out surrounded by water. Uh, most of them don't belong to a private organization. They still belong to the Coast Guard and you're not going to go out unless you know somebody in the local Aton group or something like that. So for lighthouse nuts, they come and they love this place. We also had the advantage when we opened it to the public that it's much larger in size than a typical tower would be. A typical tower is only big enough to have a spiral staircase. So we can bring in 20 people at a time. We can even have 20 people upstairs, as long as they don't all try to pass on the stairs at one time. <laughs> the steps are steps, as you'll see, until you get to the last outside and to the last up into the equipment room, up into the gallery. Uh, that's the ladder. We don't let anybody go up in the landing room. You can look up there. But it's just too small to have people go up. I mean, the max you can do would be good for people. So you can look at it, but you can't go in it. The basement, we don't let people go down there because A, it's dark and dank, it's a dungeon, and it's got a very steep set of stairs. So we figure that's kind of a problem. So with that, you're free to wander. We've started to furnish the place. You'll see it's got some furnishings here and the keeper's quarters. bell was cast a couple of years before the lighthouse was really built.
upkeep of these things is, is incredible. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are organizations out there, uh, the American Lighthouse Association, and, uh, mm -hmm. certain cities that the lighthouses are located in, wanted to adopt them as you know part of their okay. history or whatever. So we yeah. gave it to them with the understanding that we would take care of the light itself mm -hmm. and that they would maintain the maintenance of the, the rest of the structure. Now what happens if if they fall in disrepair with the post They already have. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, most are some degree. They have uh, realized that it takes quite a bit of money. <laughs> we're, Port we're inside Portland Headlight, just uh, I guess you might call this the watch room, full of the lantern room here. Is that what you would call this? Lantern deck. Or that's the lantern deck. Up actually. above us is the lantern deck. The gear room. This is like the first lantern deck, maybe you could say. Oh. Or, anyway, we're near the top of Portland Headlight in Maine, and this is the oldest lighthouse in Maine. It was uh, established in 1791 by the order of President George Washington. and. Uh, he appointed the first keeper here, and the light is now, and the entire property, the Keeper's Museum and the Keeper's House and the Lighthouse are now beautifully maintained by the town of Cape Elizabeth. Um, and the light was automated and uh, turned over to the town of Cape Elizabeth in 1989. I was talking before about the, uh, the keepers that were here, the family of keepers that were here for about 60 years, the Strouts. They had uh, Joshua Strout, the father, and Joseph Strout, the son, that were here for a combination of about 60 years. And uh, I always like the stories about the son that had a, a famous parrot named Billy that would uh, tell Keeper Strout that it was time to put the foghorn on. That's what they say. Billy lived for a long, long time. I forget how many years, but like 70 or 80 years or something like that. And when was this first built? When was it first built? 1791. <laughs> and it was raised and lowered by 20 feet a couple of times. In the museum, there's a good display with different pictures showing the, uh, the changes it went through over the years. The Keeper's House that's here now was built in 1891, if I'm remembering right. It's a Victorian Keeper's House, and I think it's one of the most beautiful houses in any lighthouse in New England. I, I always tell people, when people ask me what my favorite lighthouse is, I have trouble picking one, but if they force me to pick one, I, I pick this one.
This is the Cape Elizabeth East light. This, this whole area, as you can see from all the signs, is often called two lights. And uh, the two lights are this one, the east light and the west light, which is out of sight from here, but you saw it from the bus. And if you, if you walk out far enough on the rocks here, you can see back and see both lights. But uh, I, don't know if to, I don't know how much you know about the fact that there were a number of twin light stations along the coast. And this was the first twin light station in Maine. The reason why they did this kind of thing, why they built two lights instead of just one, is because in the early days of lighthouses, the technology wasn't that good for making like revolving or flashing lights. So instead of having, you have to, obviously a mariner out at sea has to be able to differentiate the lights from each other, especially when they're close to each other so they can tell where they are. Um, so in the early days, because they couldn't make flashing lights very well, they tried, but they just weren't that efficient. So in some cases, to differentiate one light from another, like Portland headlight from a light here, instead of just building one light, they built two. So that way the mariner out at sea would see the one light over here, see Portland headlight, and see the two lights and know where they were by seeing those lights. So. We're really at the, the entrance to the Casco Bay here. Ships coming from the ocean would come along the coast here and see the two lights here, know they were heading towards uh, Portland and into the Casco Bay, past Portland Headlight, Ram Island Ledge Light that you saw offshore there. Then eventually as they get closer to Port Portland Harbor, see uh, Spring Point Ledge and Portland Breakwater Light and lead them right into the harbor. So um, the first lights were built here in 1828 and there were stone towers. Uh, for a while, they were painted a really strange way. They, they had, um, let's see if I have it here. They had the uh, west tower for a while had a vertical red stripe, and the east tower had four horizontal red bands. So there's a couple of photographs of those lights when they existed, and that, that was kind of an unusual thing. Um, during the Civil War, there was uh, there would be two families living here with uh, who were the keepers and their families and the kids helped take care of the lights. And uh, in one case, there was a 16-year-old daughter and a younger brother, I'm not sure of his age, they were officially assistant keepers to their father. Uh, the name was Staples, last name. And uh, during the Civil War, well, when Lincoln was shot, the kids had the job of draping the towers and with black drapes, they like put black bunting out when Lincoln was shot. Um, in 1874, the first lighthouses were in bad shape, so they built these. They're cast iron, lined with brick, very strong. I, I, to me, this is one of the most handsome lighthouses around. Right. And, it's, and it's on private property. Yes, the uh, the house, which you'll see better if you go up on the rocks, just to the left of it, is is privately owned by a New York businessman. Um, I want to sh show you. Uh, some of you have probably heard of Edward Hopper, famous American painter, who painted a very famous painting of the two two lights. He painted a lot of paintings here, but this is probably the most famous one. I want to pass that around. And uh, later on, there was there was a stamp based on that. June, up in the water here. Down here. Well, there's seals in, in the water. Um, basically, uh, these, first of all, I don't know how many of you know exactly what range lights are. Does anybody know what that means or more or less know? Well, I'll explain that briefly. Just, um, <clears throat> you have two lights here. Obviously, this is the front range light, and this is the rear range light back there in the woods. You can see it's flashing every how many seconds? Six. Every six seconds. 
And, <clears throat> excuse me, we're at a bend in the Kennebec River here. This is called Fiddler's Reach around this, here. This area um, here is called Fiddler Reach. Uh -huh. Yeah. This okay. is Doubling Point. This is Doubling Point here, right? Fiddler's Reach up, up here? Yeah. Okay. And um, there's like a double bend in the river here, actually. And as uh, boaters, mariners would be coming up the river from that way, they would line up, or still do, line up the two lights, one in front of the other, the front light in front of the, the rear light, and keep them in line as they're coming in and know they're in the correct channel and try not to veer from that, that path. And uh, then as they go up around here, eventually they see Dublin Point light, the other light up, up the road here. I don't know if you want to add anything about well, that. Well, the, the reason they have to be careful is that the river the river's 100 feet deep in the channel, but it, it shallows out very dramatically after that. Mm -hmm. And uh, even now, there are large ships coming out, Navy destroyers coming up the river. So um, they're built, you saw them on the uh, bridge, as you came across the bridge, fast, fast ironwork. They come back and forth here fairly regularly, and they really do need to use these lights in the, uh, in the evening when they come up. This is the way they get to the Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, this river goes out to sea. It's a very old and very deep river, although right here, as I say, well, it's 100 feet in the middle, but it's very shallow near the edges. Um, what they, they come up uh, right toward these two lights, keeping them lined up, and at the point they see the doubling point light around the corner, they make the turn and head for that, and when, when they see another light up the river, then they turn again. So if they're very careful with their navigation and there's no fog, uh, everything works out great. It's, it's wonderful. It fills the river. Uh -huh. There used to be steam passenger steamers coming through here years oh, yes. ago. Yeah. Major, major ships. It's, it's very, uh, it's wonderful to have this uh, facility, Bath Iron Works, up here. They're building uh, military ships now, but they hope to get back into uh, cargo ships. Mm -hmm. it's Maine's, it was Maine's largest employer, I think, still is. They let you know when they're coming? Yes, they do. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Hmm. The uh, main Maritime Museum, which I mentioned where we crossed over the bridge, which is down the road from the ironworks, runs cruises here in the summer, uh, several different cruises that come up through the river. Some of them go all the way to around Booth Bay Harbor, that area. And there are also cruises out of Booth Bay Harbor you can take to go the opposite way. They come up the river this way and you see a bunch of lighthouses. These, these range lights were built in 1898 and as part of a system of lighthouses that was uh, erected along the river here in 1898. I should say New York. Oh, I'm, I'm Paul Coxon. I, I live next door and I'm one of the range light keepers. And he also keeps the uh, website for the range light keepers, which is an excellent website, www.rlk.org. Thank you, sir. <laughs> RLK. RLK, yeah. range, range light keepers. keepers. Um, another thing I was going to mention, a couple of little, little facts that are interesting about this place. One is that one of the old glass Fresnel lenses, the old style lenses that was removed from here, I'm not sure how many years ago. I have it somewhere. I don't, in the notes, I don't know but, myself. Uh, one of those lenses ended up at a privately built lighthouse up in Rockland. It's called Rockland Harbor Southwest Light. We're not going to see it. It's a private driveway and everything. But um, we never could drive the bus up that driveway. It's harder than this. But anyway, uh, it was privately built by a doctor there in Rockland, and he somehow, I guess he got it from the Coast Guards, which who had gotten it from here. So one of those lenses ended up there. Another thing is that this this station had one of the last, if not the last. Coast Guard women, woman keepers in the country, a woman named Karen McLean in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and for a while, I believe it was her job to also uh, be in charge of keep an eye on uh, Squirrel Point Light yes, up the indeed. river and Dublin Point Light. So uh, she was in charge of three, three light stations, basically. Her husband was uh, a commander of Bay Harbor, was that right? Or he, he was, and during some of the, he was also, he started out being the light keeper here, and then he uh, resigned from the Coast Guard to get into private boat work, mm -hmm. uh, but he's now back in the Coast Guard, and she is out of it. Oh, and they okay. are now in upstate New York. Uh huh. But there are a lot of good uh, newspaper clippings on her, articles on her at the time, and uh, got some information on my website about her. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add about the history. Or... No, I think it's... There's still a Coast Guard family that lives in the house here.
The Pemaquit Point Lighthouse was first built during the years of 1824 through 1827. The construction contract specified that the tower was to be built of undressed stone that tapered from 18 feet at the base to 10 feet at the top. The walls from the base to the top were to be of graduated thickness from three and a half feet at the base to two feet at the top. Apparently the masons at the time used salt water in the mixing of the mortar and in 1835 the lighthouse crumbled and deteriorated and later in 1837 the keeper's house also met the same fate. Both were torn down and both were rebuilt. Both still stand today. The tower is 38 feet tall and the keeper's house is now the Lighthouse Museum. One step at a time, there you go. Okay. <laughs> so this is the original lens. It's a Fresno lens. And it's worth quite a bit of money. And this is one of the smaller ones that I have. I have one that's the size of this cupola also. Oh. And it's fairly expensive to replace these. These lenses are chipped and old and to send them out and have them replaced. Um, the heat, hot and cold. And I imagine people from moving things in here or changing things, people probably hit it and, and broke it. How do how much power is that man? Uh, this is a thousand watt. 1,000 watts? 120, just a regular like, household mm -hmm. light, light socket. Yeah, okay. We use 1,000 watts uh, for our, our, our TV lights yeah. and the cable uh, station that I work for. And uh, These are a little bit bigger though. <laughs> <laughs> and how is it all wired together? There's a, this is a lamp changer and when, it, uh, when that lamp um, extinguishes it'll flip around. I'll push a little trip thing here to the next position the second light will come on. Mm -hmm. So I come out about once every three months and I make sure that the, the lamps are working properly and, and everything's working all right. Make sure the lens is clean so you can tell it gets dirty fairly quickly. I was here oh, about a month and a half ago and all the bugs come back and the light gets dirty so. <laughs> Just like at home. <laughs> yeah this is a fairly easy one and there's people at the museum that that maintain the light. But there's a lot of ones that there's nobody out there. I have to go out on a little island. Oh, really? And it's, yeah. it's a little bit dirtier and the birds are a little bit crazier. The seagulls aren't very friendly. <laughs> Coming into view is a small brick building in a tall obelisk type tower first built in 1897 to house an automatic bell striking machine that was powered by weights in the tower. In 1992, Hurricane Bob destroyed the tower, which was later rebuilt. It was originally built in 1832 and was updated in 1858. It's been manned until uh, the 1970s. At one time, it was a Loran A station. Uh, the uh, St. George Historical Society rented this building, the Keeper's House, from the Coast Guard until the Main Lights program was established. At that time, uh, through the efforts of Island Institute, we were given the deed to the property, and it is now our responsibility to maintain the keeper's house and the grounds, and we do so. Therefore, we have quite a few uh, 
uh, quite a bit of information about St. George, the township of St. George, as well as local information, including the lighthouse. So it's uh, kind of a nice place. It is The lighthouse is at the junction of Muscongas Bay to the west and Penobscot Bay to the east. And although it is an inland light and used primarily by the fishermen of uh, Port Clyde uh, during the heyday of sailing vessels and steam vessels and uh, lumber industry on Penobscot Bay, it was an important light for ships coming from the south into the uh, west approaches to Penobscot Bay. Uh, many of us remember the, mo the movie Forrest Gump uh, that was filmed here, right? Yes, it was. It was filmed here. It's just a very short portion of the, uh, the movie, but uh, in his running across the United States, he ended up on the East Coast, ran up our gangway, and touched the door of the lighthouse. And when I got there, I figured since I've gone this far, might as well turn around, just keep on going. When I got to another ocean, I figured since I've gone this far, I might as well just turn back, keep right on going. When I got tired, I slept. When I got hungry, I ate. Uh, we have also had uh, the Ford Explorer, uh, actually it's a Ford excursion people here. Uh, we had just rebuilt the gangway because it was old, the walkway, and it uh, was uh, pressure treated lumber, it was green. They came up, got permission to shoot a commercial here, and the producer looked at the walkway and said, it's not white. Well, our uh, head of maintenance volunteer said, well, I'm sorry, we haven't uh, don't have the funds to uh, to paint the walkway yet. Uh, we're kind of waiting on it. The producer turned to his gang and said, get me paint, brushes, all the things that this gentleman needs. We want that white, painted white. So uh, one day we had a paint party on the walkway and we only painted the west side white. So they took their pictures and then after they left we leisurely painted the east side and the top and the underside of it, but uh, uh, even Mercedes-Benz has used Marshall Point as a uh, locale for commercials and uh, we still get requests and as everybody knows it's wonderful to have a, a wedding at a lighthouse like this and we our schedule this summer is quite filled with couples that want to get married at Marshall Point. So we're, we're quite proud of the little location we have here.
built in 1902. As they were building the breakwater out into the harbor, they kept moving a temporary light to the end of the breakwater. Finally, when they finished it in 1902, they built a permanent lighthouse out at the end. And keepers lived out there for many years. When the keepers lived out there, instead of having to walk back and forth all the time, they would go out by boat because, especially in the winter, if you can imagine, you know, this would be covered with ice at times and the storms, you know, it's, the waves are lapping over here. So the keepers uh, pretty much traveled back and forth by boat. Uh, the lighthouse itself is a 25-foot brick tower. It's attached to the keeper's house, as you see when you get out there. It was also a fog signal building that's part of the, the structure. It's all one, uh, one building. Uh, the inside of the lighthouse, which unfortunately we're, we're not going to be able to see today, is lined with ceramic tile, which was kind of unusual, very unusual. Only a couple of lighthouses I know of like that. This was a stag station, meaning uh, only male keepers lived here. No families lived here. Just, to, just uh, there'd be probably two male keepers out here at all times. Um, one a little interesting fact: in 1951, one of the Coast Guard keepers out here caught a 27-pound lobster. Uh, that's not a record, but it's a pretty darn big lobster. <laughs> probably kept them fed for a while out here. Uh, there's a group out here, a nonprofit group called the Friends of Rockland Breakwater Light, that now takes care of the lighthouse. Uh, it's actually owned by the city of Rockland and leased to the Friends of Rockland Breakwater Light. And the group is a chapter of the American Lighthouse Foundation. So it's a little complicated, but uh, it's a good local group of uh, volunteers that are working very hard to restore this lighthouse. One of the presidents of the group is Dot Black, who is the wife of Ken Black, who is the director of the Shore Village Museum, which has the largest uh, collection of lighthouse lenses in the country. We'll be going there tomorrow. So. Uh, Unless there are any questions with that, I guess we'll be heading out to the, the lighthouse and see if we can make it all the way. We'll give it a shot anyway. Okay, good luck. Okay, thank you. Okay, everybody can wave to the camera. Hey. Hey. Hawaii, everybody goes head loose. Bunch of Head loose, this means head loose. Yeah. Oh, yeah, let's do it that way. Okay. All set? Okay, keep going. Wave, everybody wave. Here we go. Pan in the crowd. Bye. This is a picture of the screen time. You have enough kids to take it Gotta get practice on the camera. I feel like the queen. Maybe he's just going down the lake. Yeah. Thank you, Pete. Yeah, it's a Ferrari. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Now, how's this hydrant got to say? Well, you get out of that road there. You go up about 4.2 miles. <laughs> we're in the water. We're in the water. What are you doing? We're about 300 miles. <laughs> I can handle that. last couple of years. Hopefully it will be uh, restored and used for some purpose in the future. But uh, you can see it's pretty unusual. I don't know of another lighthouse that's quite like this with the walkway going up like that the way it does. Because this is such a high promontory or cliff overlooking the Penobscot Bay, you didn't need a really tall lighthouse here. You just need the little, little stubby lighthouse that's up there. But um, it's a beautiful lighthouse from land or water. It's a really nice sight when you're passing by by water too. 
and uh, the lighthouse was built in 1825. Um, this is the only lighthouse that's ever been on this spot. I believe the, I don't think the lantern is original, the top part of it I think uh, was replaced at some point along the line, but and it still has its uh, Fresnel lens, fourth order Fresnel lens? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a fourth order Fresnel lens, so we are. Anyway, uh, as I mentioned before, this, this uh, lighthouse was the favorite one of uh, Anna Merle Snow, who was the wife of Edward Rose Snow, who I've told you a lot about, the historian who wrote a lot about lighthouses and was the Flying Santa for over 40 years. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a nice nice connection there. Uh, let's see, I told you about the dog. Spot the uh, fog dog who lived here. <laughs> keeper uh, Augustus Hammer in 1930. Around 1930, he was keeper here, and uh, he had this dog, Spot, that the story goes that Spot would uh, ring the fog bell when a boat would come uh, near Owl's Head, and the boats would answer by blasting their fog horn or ringing a bell in reply. And uh, there's a story that one time the Matinicus mail boat was coming close to here in, in fog and coming very close to, to Owl's Head, to the, to the rocks, and uh, Spot started barking excitedly as loud as he could until the mail boat finally steered away. The captain realized he was so close to land and he steered away at the last moment. So Spot was uh, considered a hero dog. And they say, or I think it might have been in Edward Snow Snow's writing, that he said uh, Spot was buried here near the lighthouse, but in my experience, I've never figured out where, where it was, and Malcolm Rouse, the last keeper here, didn't know where it was. You don't know about that by any chance, do you? I sure don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's your assignment for next year. <laughs> Our assignment for all of us is to look around the cliff and see if we can figure out a place where... I got an email from a guy a couple of weeks ago who wants to propose to his girlfriend by taking her up on the cliff. And, and having friends set up candles spelling out, will you marry me down below? Really? You know, yeah. like around sunset. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> and he's a descendant of Secretary <laughs> George Woodward, who was here okay. in the 30s. Oh, so um, I told them I'd yeah. scut it out today and, and let them know. But I know there's a fence up near the light. Huh?
I was made uh, honorary. Are you are you are you? Yeah, right. And usually we started the I started the the uh the one for you. There you go. It's good. Years. Good. Good. Well, I gotta ask where everybody's from. New Jersey. Where? New York. <laughs> uh, oh, well. Where? Parsippany. Parsippany. Where the hell is Parsippany? By Morristown. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> the reason I ask this, you know, I, I get people like, like this. I come from New Jersey. Oh. There's a place called, called uh, Richfield Park. Mm -hmm. and, and I used to go down. My mother my mother lived in Bloomfield in a big apartment house. It's called the Troy Towers. You might know that. And I used to go down, down to see my mother, and I'd go into this big apartment building, and, and uh, I'd have to re push the doorbell, of course, and then, then she, she'd uh, answer it and let, let me in. But before she did, she'd say, who's there? <laughs> and I'd say, it's me, mother. Just stop. And she'd open the push the bell and let me in. <laughs> then I'd go upstairs, and certainly glad you're here. A couple of things I've got to tell you about before, before we start. The, we recognize that you're some special people meaning that you've got an, an interest, intense interest in lighthouses. So we're going to give you a little bit more uh, than we, we normally do, and as far as, the, oh, excuse me, as far as the tourists concerned. One of the things I want to specifically tell you, please don't hesitate to, in, to ask, interrupt us to ask any questions. We've been throwing some of the damnedest questions you can imagine. <laughs> but we'll give, you, we'll, we'll, we'll give you an answer, and it'll be a good answer. And if we don't know, we'll tell you that, too. I think we did in 72. You was the first good answer. Right? <laughs> it was a long, 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 long time. We have the largest collection of lighthouse lenses on display any place in the United States, and we're going to go into some, some detail on this. We have some unusual things going to happen to us. The city of Rockland and all its wisdom has sold this building. So we're, we're, we still have a home, but uh, there's a two, two year, two year uh, lease on this thing that uh, we've got two years to go to a new location. I expect that we have several angels. You know what angels are? Yes. Well, we, we have a couple of those that uh, I'm looking before the summer's over. We'll have, have some definite, something definite, and it'll be good, and it'll be very good. So, cross your fingers for us, and that it, it, it is. But we will do something, and we have two years to, to do, uh, excuse me, to do uh, with it. So, uh, I'm going to let John, John Captain Flint here, Captain Flint is, is a, an expert primarily on these lenses and all kinds of nautical, nautical things. And, and John comes from, from Maine. He's a Mainer. You can tell. He, he looks like <laughs> he, he really does. So, but again, please don't hesitate to ask any questions. Uh, interrupt us anytime. And uh, John, John is going to show you this room and the other room, and then I'll follow up in the back, back room. All these lighthouse lenses, all the tools, everything was made of brass, brass, brass. And we have a hell of a lot of brass in this museum. Now guess what I hate to do more than anything else? Polish brass. Where do I get my brass polishes? Those I catch fondling the brass. So be very wary about me keeping an eye on you. Well, as you know, these are what we call the classical Fresnel lenses. And they were invented, of course, by the Frenchman Augustin Fresnel in about 1824. He was an engineer by trade. He was sort of a loner. And he had a brother who was a lighthouse keeper. And I assume that one day Augustine's brother came to him and said, Augustine, we've got these lousy lights in lighthouses. You're supposed to be so damn smart. Why don't you invent something? And he did. And this is the result. He became one of the world experts on light ray propagation. Now what Augustine Farnell did, he started with a massive magnifying belt. And then these curved prisms and the beehive. What these lenses do, they do three things. They magnify, they elongate, and project 
a solid beam of light, and this lens captures 80% of the light from a light source. How about your car headlight? It loses 80% of the light. And they have just in recent years, they're now putting Fresnel lenses on cars in the last five years. They've been very small to learn from Augustine Fresnel. Now, Fresnel was French. <coughs> And they would take, in France, they would take and they would cast these massive prisms. And then they would hand each prism out to a French housewife who would take it home. And every night when all the chores were done, she'd sit there and polish these lenses. Hand polished. And when they finished, this edge was so sharp that the men who assembled these complained they were getting cut. So I said, please don't do such a great job and do that. Leave a little rounded edge so we don't get cut. Now, the Fresnel lens had one basic problem to it. It was a fixed all around light. And if you did not know where you were at night and you saw this light on the horizon, you had no way of determining which lighthouse it was. And the result is that in time, this lens here was installed out at Pete Manan, way down east, in 1854. Its problem, as I say, was the fact it was a fixed light. What did they do to modify it? Rather than throwing the whole thing away and starting with a segmented lens, they installed an exterior turntable. This is why it's a rail lens. The long panels we call flash panels. So you had the fixed light, and as this panel came around, driven by a clockwork motor, came around very, very slowly, you had an overriding flash, so you could now identify Petit Manan. Now people ask and say, well, how and why did you acquire these lenses? When they automated the lights, there was no keeper there to maintain the stations and the lights. Now when you had a keeper there, <clears throat> when dawn broke, he would climb the top of the tower, he'd blow out the lamp, he would polish the lamp, fill the font, polish the brass, and then his instruction said, you will then wash the lens with a good quality white wine. <laughs> and you know what happened to consumption of wine in Lighthouse Service. <laughs> and they soon changed to vinegar. <laughs> now his last act was to put a white muslin cover over this lens. And that was not to keep the dust off. When you were young, you'd take a magnifying glass and burn the back of your wrist. You could imagine the sun coming up, hitting this great magnifying belt. It would destroy the lamp. So without a keeper being there, you had to use something that would prevent the sun's rays from going ahead and destroying the lamp. Now, well, this was electrified, and they came out with a standard 1,000 watt lamp. This is the lamp from Petit Manan. This one is This lens obviously is no longer there. What replaced this lens? This one right here. And this is the lamp in that lens. Now you say a little lens like that, comparing to this, it's in a range of about 22 miles. So what kind of a range would you get from that? Well now, now France made probably about 80-85% of the lenses, lighthouse lenses. And then in, in England, the Chance Brothers started to make lenses. But about 1910, we had an American who decided he wanted to build lighthouse lenses. Now he knew that he could not find French housewives to go ahead and polish his lenses. What did he do? He was the inventor of lens grinding machinery. And this is a beautiful lens, and you rotate, you can see what it was, with the 12 bullseyes flashing that way, what a beautiful lens this is. It came from the Great Lakes. We're not sure which light station had it, but it is a lovely, lovely lens. Now, 1910, he was about 10 years too late, and the market was saturated. So what did he do? He converted his lens-running machinery to do what? To make eyeglasses. 
Before that time, these were hand ground and hand polished and very, very expensive. Today, I pay $9.99 for mine at Walmart. I don't know how much you people pay for yours. But he became quite well to do, and the company became known as the Corning Glass Company. So you see, he, uh, he mm -hmm. made out all right in time. Yeah, now, we talk about the motive power. The motive power was a brass clockwork movement, driven by weights, as a, as a great grandfather's clock would be. And the keep would climb the top of the tower four times a night or so, and he would crank up the weights. This would get in with a chuck behind him in the turntable and made that lens rotate four times a night. This could have been designed to run all night long on one cranking. And it was not designed that way. Why? Keep the guy awake. So he could climb the top of the tower to crank the weights, so he made sure that the lamp hadn't blown out, hadn't flared up, and was not smoking. So now you see he was up all night long, up and down the stairs to the tower, and when dawn broke, as I mentioned, he had to go ahead, polish the brass, fill the fonts. This had to be done by 10 a.m. daily. Then he went to work. That's why he did it all his painting and his repairs and whatnot. So he put in a 28-hour day, in case anybody wanted to become a, a lighthouse keeper. It was not a really a pleasant way to spend your time. <laughs> now, on the right-hand side, going to this door, on the right-hand side, you'll see a chart of the main coast. And each little light indicates an existing lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> well now, this is how the land looks with a sailor aboard ship. Flashing the flashing light. By counting the number of flashes and the time sequence, you can identify precisely which light you're seeing. Now the most unusual of all these lighthouse lights is the one down the bottom case. You're going to watch that. That's one flash. Four flashes. Three flashes. We know what that is. You know you do. Minus lead light. That's all the time. And it became known as the lover's light. Why? Is because in shore there's a beach called Cohasset Beach. And young lovers would go down to that beach in the moonlight. I don't know what they did. I went to see in my formative years. You understand that? <laughs> they watched the submarine race. <laughs> <laughs> but they would look out there and they'd say, see the light is talking to us became known as Love at Light because one, four, three, I love you. Well, when the Coast Guard took over, they wanted to standardize these light signals and they changed minus light. And all these lovers wrote to the congressman, they said, hey, what are you gonna do about it? And the congressman told the Coast Guard, you return one, four, three to minus lead light. And it still flashes that today. Now, yeah. One thing on that, the, the local newspaper in Hull, on Valentine's Day every year, they have at least two full pages. You know, the little thing, Mary, oh, 143 John. <laughs> yeah. And the people are already asking, what's that mean? You know, from oh, sure. Toronto. But it's amazing. There's some pages of that paper that have all the little things and the 143 stuff on it. Yeah. Now, one of the problems that you had when they began to automate these lights, with no keepers being there, and the Tom Edison lamp being up there, what if that lamp burned out at night? That was a problem. They went ahead and came out with a little primitive timing motor here and a little four lamp changer. And when the lamp burns out, up comes a new lamp. And the day, of course, they're all solid state flashes. And this one here would change a lamp so rapidly that you'd never know aboard ship that the lamp had burned out. Out. We really haven't opened this year. We've got another two weeks for opening, so we're still getting things back together again. Well, we'll wind them up. There we go. Now, all of your buoys, all of your beacons, and within a few years, all lighthouses will be powered by solar panels. This is a typical buoy light or beacon light. 
These are all solar powered. And a panel this size will keep two batteries charged. And this will operate for one year without servicing. So the reliability has increased tremendously on the lighthouse system. Now, since you're all lighthouse people, and we'll give you some, I'm going to add some questions during this tour. And again, I get brass polishes from those who fail to pass the examination. But the problem you have with lighthouses is, of course, fog, rain, snow, sleet. What did they do? They first put a cannon in the front yard, and the keeper had to fire his cannon every half hour. And we have the story of an early Maine keeper and his first job, and he had 19 days of fog. When the fog cleared, he rode ashore and he said, I herewith resign. I need my sleep more than I need the job. <laughs> well, this is not working too well. What can we do? If we can make this lens rotate with a clockwork motor, let's make a great big cast iron clockwork motor it's in the back room there. We'll build a pyramid shaped tower and we'll hang a 1,000 pound bell out there. And now you have the great historical fog bell. And there goes the bell. But you see, these were weight driven as well as the lens. The bell has a limited range. And what they had to do next was to find some way of getting a longer ranging sound. And we have a, it's not working right now, so we haven't got to open up the summer yet. So what they did, they built a little brick house out there, put a boiler in there, could steam up, and you had the famous old diaphone. This is a little bottle. And for those you got type. <clears throat> then they went into <clears throat> mechanical fog horns. <clears throat> what are they doing today? <clears throat> Solid state. Little chip circuit board, an amplifier, and speakers. Now the Coast Guard says that the higher the frequency, the longer the range. But the Coast Guard has not yet realized it is that every, but every man here over the age of 40, you have lost high frequency hearing. So we could hear the old, we hear it right here. We don't hear these nearly as good as the old type of but tell the Coast Guard that. <clears throat> as you know, the Coast Guard gets seasick, they hate water and they hate lighthouses. So it's always been a problem with the Coast Guard. <laughs> now, <clears throat> In the history of mankind, how long have there been lighthouses? Way back in the Faraday, wasn't it? 2,500 years. Pretty close. Very close. 2,285 years ago. And that was the famous Pharos of Alexandria. And that was built on the Egyptian coast and designed by a Greek engineer whose name was Sostratus. 400 feet tall. He was very proud of this, obviously. So upon completion, this great marble structure going up, on the facade he carved an inscription which said, Sostratus of Gidos, may the gods protect those who are upon the sea. But being Greek, he was wise, and he knew if the pharaoh saw Sostratus' name emblazoned across the pharaoh's lighthouse, his life would be shot considerably. And so he put a thin cement wash in the inscription to conceal it. Going in a hundred years or so with the pharaoh long dead, the cement wash was rolled away, and there for all the world to see was the guy who designed and built the fabled lighthouse at Alexandria. And it lasted for 1,500 years before finally an earthquake toppled into the sea. And you probably know in the last two or three years they've been doing uh, underwater archaeology, and they have found much of the material from the great fabled lighthouse there. Now this light burned wood for the light. Can you imagine the keeper? 400 steps to bring up the wood every hour or so? Can you imagine how much wood you would burn in 1,500 years? You ever wonder why there are no trees in Egypt? They cut them off with this stupid light. And that was a great problem. In France, we had a lighthouse keeper and cut every tree down at about five miles of his light and he became desperate. And he found a vein of coal and began to dig coal and burned his wood-fired light to a coal-fired light. 
too straight. It was brighter, longer lasting than wood. And they began, where we had a coal mine near a lighthouse, they converted to a coal-fired light. And coal-fired light was still being used up until 1825. Over here, we got a, a, a collection of the tops of sardine cans. The people say, what the hell have sardines got to do with, with lighthouses? Or light, and, and, <coughs> tell it, nothing, really. The only reason we got the, the, the sardines is you, we figured out the lighthouse to death, so we changed the subject just a little bit. <laughs> Works pretty well, too. But, these are these are all main. These are all all main sardines. The tops are all uh, main sardines, and uh, the uh, back down here not on display. We do have uh, we do have quite a few of the Canadian. There's only about six sardine cans, coastal sardine factories uh, left, and they've been slowly going out. And the reason that the, actually is, is the. Uh, uh, they, they've automated these things, uh, these, these plants so much that uh, they, they produce it, and you don't need a great, great many, many, uh, many, many things. But has anybody, anybody here ever seen them pack sardines? What? Ever seen them pack no. sardines? No. no. Fascinating. Fascinating. This is all done by hand. They've never developed a machine that can successfully pack. Pack uh, sardines. You all know the size. You know, incidentally, before we go any further, there's no such fish as a sardine. <laughs> cool. I hate to ask what these are. There, it, Since well, I eat them. <laughs> but there's no such fish as a as as a uh, sardine. Uh, the uh, fish are herring, and there's there's uh, all kinds of herring too, and uh, they are all all are packed in these, these things, so they don't become a sardine they are in, in, into the can. So, now, you, as I say, you all, you all know the size of you all know the size of a sardine can. But you, again, you don't know is that the woman, well, I, I forgot, the one thing I forgot to tell you, the, the woman is the breadwinner in the sardine packing family. She's dexterous, she's nimble, she can do things that men can't do. And I'm not going to touch that any further than <laughs> any further than that. But the fish, herring, will come down on an endless belt, and the, the packer, who, assuming she's a right-handed person, has taken her left hand and covered her left hand completely with with adhesive tape, or now we use duct tape. It's cheaper and and, and better. And and uh, in her right hand, a razor-sharp pair of scissors. And they all have their own scissors, and they keep them razor sharp. Now, as I said, the, the herring come down on, on an endless belt. You grab the first fish with the left hand, scissors in the right, cuts off enough of the front of the fish to fit into the can. Now, if they're packing big ones, which they do quite often in, in Maine, and uh, they're packing packing big ones, they oft, often have to cut a piece of the tail off. Off goes the head, off goes the tail, uh, into the can. Grab the next fish, off goes the head, off goes the tail, upside down into the can. Now, she's doing that so fast, her hand's just a, a blood. You heard of uh, uh, King Oscar sardine? Mm -hmm. They're Norwegian. And they're, they're relatively expensive. Now, they have some of their fish is packed this way. They're so small, they pack them this way.
That's N-U-B-B-L-E, but the official name of this lighthouse is Cape Nedic Lighthouse, N-E-D-D-I-C-K. The island itself and the lighthouse have been called the Nubble for a long time, and that's what most people know it as. Uh, I've heard of, I've seen the word Nubble used maybe for a couple of, uh, one or two islands in the uh, Great Britain, so I think that's where the name comes from, but I don't really know the origins of it. But anyway, uh, an explorer named uh, Bartholomew Gosnold, who might have heard of who was an early explorer known for Cape Cod especially, but explored New England in the early 1600s. He was around here in 1602 and he called this Savage Rock, not because boats hit it all the time, but because he met with the local Indians on the rock and of course the Europeans referred to the Indians as savages. And uh, so that's why this was called Savage Rock for a while. There was a ship called the Isidore, I-S-I-D-O-R-E or Isidora, that was wrecked here, right near here in 1842, if I remember right. Um, and there's a legend of a, that it's a ghost ship, that it continues to, to go by as a ghost ship with a phantom crew haunting the area. Uh, I can't say that, you know, I've never seen it, but that's, that's the legend here. But even though there were shipwrecks like that over the years here, they asked for a lighthouse here starting in 1807, but didn't get built until 1879. So it took a long, long, lot of complaints and a long time to finally get this built. Uh, it's a cast iron lighthouse. It's lined with brick to give it more durability, make it more sturdy. And uh, you can see it has a flashing red light. And obviously it has a covered walkway between the house and the, uh, the tower, which meant that they could, the keepers could get to the lighthouse in bad weather without having to go outside, which is a nice feature. It's a little 
building in the foreground here, the red building, is the oil house where they would store the kerosene that was built, if I remember, in 1902. Um, and they, they, never, they always built those a little distance away from the lighthouse. You remember those one at Owl's Head downhill from the lighthouse? They didn't want them too close because when they had kerosene, it was combustible, it was flammable. You know, if you had a fire, you wouldn't want it right next to the lighthouse. So that's the reason for that. And this, uh, this is one of the few that's red. At one point, I heard the Coast Guard was going to paint it white, maybe more than one time. And every time they tried to do it, the public would complain uh, and want it red again because photographers are used to the, the red oil house there. It's very distinctive. There's only one other one that I know of at Pumpkin Island light up in the Penobscot Bay. Uh, this park here is called Sawyer Park, S-O-H-I-E-R. It was named after William Davis Sawyer, uh, who was a lawyer from Boston who gave this land to the town of York in 1929. His father bought this land for duck hunting and uh, gave it to the son, and then he gave it to the town of York. So that's the history of the park here. This lighthouse was automated in 1987, so there haven't been any keepers living here since 1987. Um, I've heard they had a ceremony here when they automated it, and dense fog and nobody could even see the lighthouse when they did it. Last guy was uh, named Russ Algren who was here with his family. And I've heard a lot of the keepers, I've heard from keepers, including Connie Small, who I mentioned the light, wrote the book The Lighthouse Keeper's Wife. Her husband Elson and she would sometimes be relief keepers here. They weren't stationed here, but they would come as a re relief keeper. And she said that they felt like they were in a fishbowl when they were here. They would go out on the porch to eat and look over and see all these tourists staring at them with binoculars. <laughs> so. She enjoyed being here, but it wasn't wasn't her favorite place because of, for that reason. <laughs>